Hello, uh, Dr. Sill here, junior doctor working at Sydney, Australia, and today I'm doing something a bit fun. I'm going to watch uh, the first episode of Scrubs. Let's compare. Since I was a kid, I've been able to sleep through anything. Storms, sirens, you name it. Last night I didn't sleep. I guess I get a little goofy when I'm nervous. You see, today isn't just any other day. It's my first day. I'm the man. And four years of pre-med, four years of med school, and tons of unpaid loans have made me realize one thing. Good. Could you go drop an NG tube on the patient in 234 and call the attending if the lavage is positive? I don't know, Jack. I love this theme song. Okay, so waking up at 6 a.m. is realistic for surgical terms because um, if you're on a surgical team, you start at 7 a.m. And, and by the way, often like 6.30 or even earlier, depending on what surgical team you're with. Uh, and it, with the medical teams, they usually start at 8 a.m., which means the intern usually starts a little bit earlier as well, uh, probably 7.30 to 8. Um, I like to get to work early. I think um, if you're not early, if you're not five minutes early, you're late. That's something that my old boss used to tell me, uh, and I love it. I think that was Aaron Try who uh, watches some of these videos. So uh, that, that has stuck with me, Aaron. Uh, what else uh, is worth reflecting on? on your, you do get an orientation before you start. You get a full week in Australia of orientation around the hospital. You get lectures and that kind of thing before you're asked to put an NG tube in. And for the record, uh, nurses are way better at putting NG to tubes Oh, sorry, in case you don't know, an NG tube is a nasogastric tube. So if someone um, has problems swallowing or um, is, you know, for, maybe they have an, an intestinal obstruction, whatever the reason, you need to get a tube to their stomach either to suck out contents or to feed contents. So someone with very severe anorexia nervosa will get an NG tube sometime, sometimes to feed them um, uh, because they just can't eat behaviorally and physically. So you put the NG tube and it, it, can, it goes from the nose, that's the end, the naso, and it goes all the way to the stomach, that's the G, the gastric, nasogastric. Um, and it's actually pretty tricky because you could, you, it, first of all, it hurts like hell. No one wants a tube that's, you know, this long to go all the way down their bloody nose. And you feed it through and sometimes it'll pop out of the mouth. Like, can you imagine feeding a tube through and you go, ah, oh, it comes out of the mouth. So then you have to pull it out and then put it back in and tilt the head forward. There's all these tricks. Um, and the most important thing about NG tubes, guys, do an x-ray before you use them. So this is actually very serious. Uh, and, and, and a nasogastric tube can kill someone if you don't do it right. So if it goes down a windpipe and into a lung and then you feed them, you know, a bag of food, then you fill the lung up full of food and that is absolutely catastrophic. So you always have to do an x-ray to make sure that the tube is all the way down below the diaphragm in the stomach. All right, there's your fun fact for the day. Let's keep going. I can't do this all on my own. No, I know I'm no Superman. I'm no Superman. So this is my story. Uh, I'm supposed to be up in intensive care. Good, we just turfed him there. Look, I became a doctor because I wanted to help people. But orientation yesterday, it didn't really focus on patient I care. I love this lawyer. Hospital doesn't want to be sued. Being sued is not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm totally down with the rap music. Dude, be whiter. Chris Turk's my best friend. We roomed together in college. We roomed together in med school. Hell, we even got accepted by the same hospital. Here's the thing, Tupac, DMX, Dr. Dre. In most of their songs, these artists use an extremely volatile racial slur. The N-word. I got it. Right. My question is this. If we're both singing along and knowing that otherwise I would never use the word, am I allowed to say... No. See, that's good for me to know. I, I didn't know that. Finally, doctors, if there is a mistake... Plus surgery, no doubt. Don't admit it to the patient. Of course, if the patient is deceased you and you're sure, you can feel free to tell him or her anything. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so... Oh, 
Oh, hang on, he's about to go into... Oh, my God. Guys, so if you make a mistake as a doctor, you have a duty of care to tell the patient, and it's called full disclosure, and it decreases your risk of getting sued. You have to tell people when you screw up. I have screwed up. Everyone, every doctor has screwed up. One time I was collecting bloods from someone, and um, this person had had oofed, maybe like three people try before me, so it was a very hard person to get blood from. But we needed this blood because they were very sick. And I um, found a vein. Now the vein was in a pretty, an area that I don't like to mess with. It, the, the vein was here and I thought I could get it. And um, the problem with this area is that there's an artery there. Okay. Now you don't want to stick a needle in an artery because it bleeds a lot. Uh, and you can form a pseudoaneurysm if you're not careful. I, right now I'm feeling my own pulse. That's the artery. It's called the brachial artery. Um, and you, you've seen in the movies, if you pop an artery, it squirts. If you pop a vein, it leaks. So anyway, I thought I could get the vein um, and I felt the artery and I felt that it was far enough from the vein that I was comfortable. And so I went in for the vein and I got, you know, I got the blood and I was very happy. But then the blood kind of stopped flowing. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes veins just collapse um, and or you're not, the needle's not very well situated in the vein. So you just kind of have to like lower it and move it forward a bit or play around with it. Sometimes you don't get the best kind of um, flow. And I had like, I had enough blood, but I needed to, I needed a bit more blood. So I played around with the needle and I, and I nicked the artery and I didn't realize it. So I was like, oh, I didn't get that. So I stopped there and I put um, a gauze on it with a bit of pressure. And then I went and was like, sorry, I'm going to have to probably do another one to get more blood. And then um, as I'm looking on my left hand and then I kind of feel warmth on my right glove and I look over and it's just, there's a lot of blood and I've got one little gauze and it's soaked through with blood. So I, I release my hand to look what's going on and it blood kind of, not, not enough blood to kind of scare you, but not like so much that it would cause hemodynamic instability or make the patient too sick. And so I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and I was alone in the room and it was a contact precaution room. So, um, you had to have gowns and, and PPE on. So I had to hit the emergency buzzer because I didn't have enough gauze to put pressure on it. And um, so they come in thinking it's a code blue or something. And I'm like, sorry, guys, I just need help. I need uh, 10 gauzes uh, just in case. And so it was no, it was a non-event. I, I just had to um, use a couple more gauzes and put pressure on it. And, uh, you know, it's not a big deal because we often do specific like you can do specific blood tests from arteries the only difference is you have to put pressure on it for five minutes afterwards instead of a vein where you can get away with putting pressure on it for just one minute and so i had to just stay there for longer and you need more gauze because she had already bled out and you know the consequence of me making this error was just a, a, a like pretty nasty bruise for a week or two um so it wasn't the end of the world but uh it was still an error and so i had to explain to her that i, I had done that error and i had to explain to her that we still needed the other blood test so i and she was she was fine with it she understood that this stuff happens and she was happy for me to do the next blood test which i got uh so i got the blood in the end so it's all good news in the end but i also had to explain it to her family because this was an aged care and um her uh you know I had to explain to her daughter that uh, I had made this error and the consequences of the error, which was that's just a nasty bruise. Um, but I had put the pressure on for long enough to reduce the risk of a pseudoaneurysm forming. So it was all good. And um, if you don't know what a pseudoaneurysm is, don't worry. It's not that interesting. It's just like, it's just a risk of getting blood from a, an artery. So anyway, it, it's something you don't want and it didn't happen. So anyway, the point of that is full disclosure, very important and is decreases your risk of getting sued. Let's continue. Hey, listen, I found us an apartment. Okay, gang. I'm Dr. Bob Kelso, and I'm your chief of medicine. So I just want to encourage you all to think of me as your safety net, because I promise you we're a family here. Now then, <laughs> go get them, doctors. So the surgical interns are gonna go grab a beer. The medical interns are having a Pac-Man tournament. Apparently, we're all 12. I love Pac-Man. Me too. I love watching it. I love playing it. I love all of it. I'm Elliot. Elliot. Yeah, don't do that. I'm JD. This is Turk. Elliot, are you medical or surgical? Medical. <laughs> Hello. 
So every male in my family is a doctor. My dad, my granddad, my brother. Yes, that's why dad gave me a guy's name, made me play sports date girls. I'm joking. I know. I would have laughed if you'd paused. Anyway, I know what you're thinking. Your butt looks like two Pringles hugging. No, you don't. I'm probably Miss Hyper Competitive. I mean, it used to be a big problem for me. <laughs> used to. Past tense. Hey! Are we, like, racing? Yes. Please, I'm not that desperate. So you do a lot of cardio, or? <laughs> oh, it read John Dorian? Great. One, I am your resident, Dr. Jeffrey Stedman. Not Jeff. Two, here are your manuals. This is a you ever notice how quickly some people make an impression? I'm a tool. I'm a tool. I'm a tool, tool, tool. An <laughs> unbelievably annoying tool. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, these are your beepers. From now on, they control your entire life. Okay? Thanks. Move it. Back to today. Okay, that was, uh, that was Paige. Aw, first day, Bambi. Yeah. Carla will take care of you. Don't look at me when we're moving somewhere. Why? We're waiting for Dr. Cuts. Hi, doctor. I'm placing an IV for me. We'll talk later. Carla, can I ask you a personal question? Do you spray the perfume on, or do you just fill your bathtub up with it at home and splash around in it? I smell <laughs> nice. Come on. You've done this to cadavers before, so this guy's alive. Just poke it through his skin. Poke it through! Now! Time's up. Carla, would you do it for him, please? I'm also gonna need an ABG. Why are you telling her? Shut up and watch. Be nice to Bambi. Why is this Gomer got... Uh, I'm pretty sure that was not an IV. That was a butterfly needle. Um... Anyway, um... I have to okay, try and die continue. every day during my lunch. It's a little insensitive. Mistake. <laughs> Ben's 92 years old. He has full dementia. He doesn't even know we're here. He is inches from Carlo's rack and he hasn't even flinched. Oh, that is so sweet. Yeah, it is. What about his subconscious? Eisenhower was a sissy. I think by the grace of God, we're gonna be okay. Oh, and from now on, Whenever I'm in the room, you're definitely not allowed to talk. Now, Duncan, can you tell me what ailment most often... I think I'm gonna love rounds. It's like being on a game show. What is... Uh, sorry, I got my feet up. <laughs> uh, guys, I've never had a boss like that. Okay, I've had the kind of bosses that that is based off, and um, even they are way nicer, and, like... I've had bosses be like, you can't ask, don't ask me that question because that question's for a registrar, not for a consultant. Because I asked a boss once what type of laxatives they wanted me to chart for his patient. And he's like, bro, just ask a registrar that. That's not a consultant question. And so that was kind of like, a, you know, that's not the nicest thing to say to an intern when they're new. You should probably be a little bit more like um, supportive, I guess. Uh, but it's fine. And uh, that style of being a boss, that kind of, Alpha, uh, hyper competitive, uh, slightly insensitive, um, high assertiveness, low agreeableness, uh, style of personality. That's kind of hopefully getting a little bit flushed out of medicine in the next generations. Because there's a lot of like 30, 40 year old bosses now who are very high level of agreeableness, um, so very uh, approachable, um, with a good level of openness. So they kind of um, are open to discussing ideas and. Uh, show some vulnerability if they're not sure what's going on and that kind of thing. Um, and that's really important in medicine because uh, the most important thing is to just have, well, it's just what's best for the patient is having a team that has good communication skills uh, and a good kind of gelling network. Let's keep going. Is uremia? That's my boy. And hey, nice clean job on the Foley catheter. I had a nurse do it. Unfortunately, I'm still afraid to talk to anybody. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about it. Yeah. A whole lot. Dr. Reed, you're late. I got puked on. You're off the hook if you can tell me what to look for in a uremic patient. Anyway, I'm going for it. Thank you. Infection? That's my girl. <laughs> Moving on. Oh, I was doing that I'm because I'm if you have uremia, you're <laughs> often very stuck. You know, oh, I, I know, thought that's right. what he was asking. Good. But thanks, if there's anything I can ever do for you, just... You could let me take you to dinner tomorrow night. Whoa! Round seven. Or eight. 
Why not? Why not? That's what she said. Why not? I prefer the fact that with Scrubs, all the relationships seem to be between the people of the same level, the different interns so far. Uh, whereas in Grey's Anatomy, it's all interns with consultants or what you would call uh, attendings. So that's pretty unhealthy in my opinion. There's a big power dynamic and so um, I just would just avoid, avoid all sexual relationships with people in different power things. Anyway, let's keep going. Well, Tiger. I gave her an answer during rounds and she screwed my brains out. <laughs> What the hell are you doing? Did you actually just page me to find out how much Tylenol to give to Mrs. Lenzner? I was worried it could exacerbate the patients. It's regular strength Tylenol. Here's what you do. Get her to open her mouth, take a handful, <laughs> and throw it at her. Whatever sticks, that's the correct dosage. But I don't have circumstances for you to compromise our no talking agreement. Dr. Kelso, he's always telling me, no, you got to stay positive. I'm going to go ahead and say this just as carefully as possible so I don't overstate it. Dr. Kelso is the most evil human being on the planet and may in fact be Satan himself. <laughs> it's just that this isn't really what I expected. You know, I love most scrubs. Most patients are uh, older and sort of checked out mentally. Pumpkin. That's modern medicine advances that keep people alive who should have died a long time ago back when they lost what made them people now <laughs> is to stay sane enough so that when someone does come in that you actually can help you're not so brain dead that you can't function for the love of god what it's just do we think we should be talking about him for her she's dead <laughs> oh. write this down Nubby. if you push around <laughs> stiff nobody will ask you to do anything you've been like a father to me Fair enough. You want some real advice? If they find out the nurses are doing your procedures for you, your ass will be kicked out of here so quick it'll make your head spin. And there it is. Have a terrific day. A couple of things that come to my mind when watching that scene. I've done aged care medicine I've, uh, and dying is, um, dying is a part of life and dying well is a privilege because so many people die poorly. I think the statistics are like 80% of people want to die at home with their family and 80% of people end up dying in hospital. And especially now during COVID, visitor restrictions and things like that make dying in hospital even worse than it was. Um, the world is getting, is, is, like is, is moving towards accepting death uh, in a healthier way. And so palliative, palliative care med... Oh, thank you, Siri. Uh, so palliative care medicine um, is uh, a very hot topic and, and is getting more involved in people's care at earlier stages. Uh, it's very important that you get palliative, palliative care involved as soon as possible in, in, in people who have kind of, you know, have months or years left. Uh, you, don't, you don't just wait till the last kind of days of their life. Also, nursing homes are awful. Just going to say it have there's there's a couple of good ones but most of them are pretty terrible places to die so um i think having a good death at home with your family is very important and i'm reflecting on that because they're saying how modern medicine just extends life and i kind of agree that it un, like th that there's been a lot of focus on extending length of life versus extending quality of life but if you're in your 20s like me um your length of quality of life will be much longer because you're like if, if you're a healthy person because you're starting your life off with very healthy habits with knowledge that a lot of people in their 80s didn't have back when they were in their 20s like they didn't know they didn't know to like have they didn't even know that smoking was bad until they were probably in their 50s or, or, or 40s or something so everyone was smoking doctors were smoking back then so we have the privilege of all the knowledge we've accumulated rant over let's keep going Really dead. 
I wonder if Turk's having the same experience I am. I'm also, so also, also, nurses can do uh, procedures and that's fine. The future of healthcare is getting uh, uh, like nurses basically to do more things that doctors are doing. So to have them prescribe more medicines that are safe, to have them uh, do more things like cannulas. They do all the catheters in my hospital. They do most of the NG tubes in my hospital. That's fine. We need to use all the resources we've got and we should use nursing staff way more than we're using them currently um, because they have the capacity and the skills and the know-how to do a lot of the things that um, take up a lot of time uh, from doctors. Oh, let's go. Doug? Probably not. This morning, I had my hands inside of a guy's chest. I couldn't even see them. I should not be allowed to do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. What's up? <that? laughs> Anyone scared? One with okay, sorry. I'm going to stop pausing so frequently, but that is a very wild experience. As a after hours um, doctor, I, I cover nights. I, I've actually got my night shift coming up. That's hence why I'm in scrubs at home. And... Um, when you have, and so one of the jobs as a, as a night shift doctor is you have to cover all the emergency C-sections. So I go and I assist uh, an obstetrician with their procedure because it's a two person procedure, but there's no other obstetricians around at night. So it's just, I, I go in the scrub with the emergency C-sections and to have your hands in like a, like an opened uterus and cleaning out gunk, whoo, I should not be allowed to do that. That's the feeling you get, but obviously I'm trained and you do it very safely and there's um, minimal risks with the parts that I'm involved with and that kind of thing. But um, it's a wild sensation, especially the patient's awake and alert and hugging their baby. And like when you have a, a uterus that's open because of the C-section, you've pulled out the baby, you've given it to the mum and the mum's crying with joy or she's nauseous from the um, meds that are keeping her numb and so she's vomiting. Uh, you can The whole abdomen's contracting and you get loops of bowels popping out and you're like pushing it back and... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's keep, let's just keep going. We are another. Everyone stops bleeding. It is so deep. No, it is. <laughs> it's a little deep. Yeah, we never got to talk about the apartment. I want to see that. Ah! <laughs> all right, how you doing? All right, man? all right. All right, Todd, JD, JD, this is my man Todd. Let's go. <laughs> and like that, I was back in high school. You see, surgical interns, they're all slice them and dice them. They're the jocks. Medical interns, we're trained to think about the body. Diagnose, test. The medical interns, well... You gotta stay. <laughs> we're the chess club. I just have bad gas. What are you testing me for? We need to know if your gas could be harmful to others. <laughs> Uh, this is very unrealistic because now we have limits on how many people can be in an elevator with COVID. <laughs> also, surgeons are not all jocks anymore, just so you know. Uh, maybe that stereotype was once true, but um, more and more surgeons are becoming academically minded and, and getting involved in research and that kind of thing. He's just scared. Talk to him. Look, Mr. Bursky. I heard a systolic murmur in your heart, which is most likely nothing. But if you don't let me check you out, I'm gonna worry about you all day. And I'll do it for you. You're a good man. Ah, oh, JD, you're a good doctor, mate. I'm, I'm waiting for someone. The door is broke. It'll be fifth time or so, it don't open. Maybe there's a penny stuck in there. Why a penny? I don't know. Did you stick a penny in there? No, I was making small talk. <laughs> if I find a penny in there, I'm taking you down. <laughs> Welcome to rounds, kids. Let's. Elliot is the only thing keeping me from losing my mind. She's my dream girl. The necrosis and infected stool most likely indicate what, Doctor Dorian? Say this. I don't know, uh, sir. I have no idea. Doctor Reed, can you help us out? I'd say it's superior mesenteric insufficiency. Oh shit. I was wrong. That's my girl. Patient number two. I say it's superior mesenteric insufficiency. Yo! Draining Miss Pratt's stomach fluid will get my spirits back up. Oh my gosh. Shut up and do it. Fantastic. Now just suck out the fluid with the giant needle. I think this needle's too big. I'm gonna get a nurse. Come on, man. Learn by doing. Learn by doing. Ah. I couldn't 
couldn't I do that? I hated him at that moment. Okay, uh, maybe the needle was just a little too big. Oh, you think? What's going on down there? Nothing, ma'am. This is totally normal. So are you gonna are you gonna move your stuff in or what? That's why I came by. I think it's better if we both branched out a little. What do you think? Tell him you think that's stupid. Tell him you need him. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. There's a lot of issues with that for Sejo. <laughs> so what's it like being a young right. hotshot doctor? It's like, did you ever go see a movie that everyone told you was great, and then because of all those expectations, you ended up totally disappointed? Movies nowadays have too many special effects. Yeah, that was pretty much my point. My first code. See, here's how it works. Someone's heart fails, they beep everyone. The first doctor in has to run the room, tell everyone what to do, basically decide if the patient lives or dies. What, am I crazy? Ha! You chicken. Don't worry about the patient. Turk was already there, learning by doing. Charge, clear! Ah! Plus, it turns out the guy was just sleeping, attached to a faulty monitor. I thought we cared about each other. I've had this, not a code, but I've had an, a rapid response to someone. What was the rapid response? It was like, um, I, I was paged because uh, they thought the, pa the patient had had a GCS drop, so a level of consciousness drop from fully alert to completely unconscious, non-responsive. And um, it was a rapid on a ward where like you rarely get rapids. So basically it's not a code blue, but it's the one under a code blue. So you have to, you have to go straight there basically. Uh, so I go straight there. I got my speedy walk on cause you can't run. So I have a speedy walk and uh, I get there and there's the senior doctors already there. It was just like, uh, yeah, GCS dropped to unconsciousness uh, and regained consciousness after shoulder squeeze. So uh, basically, the patient was sleeping. Uh, I've had heaps of funny things like that. I've had a nurse tell me that um, they thought that the patient was choking uh, and stridoring. So stridoring means you have something in your throat and so you're, you're struggling to breathe. So you're making this sound, you're going... Um, <gasps> It's, it sounds grotesque and uh, it's a very scary sound. Um, so I go to the patient who sounds like that. And then I just like give him a sternal rub to wake him up. Unfortunately, he can't speak because of a previous stroke and hence why he's at risk of uh, an aspiration and stridoring. But I give him a sternal and he wakes up and he stops stridoring. So he was just snoring. So things like this happen all the time. But you should take them, you should always take them seriously bef before you assume the best, always assume the worst. Please, if you didn't want to sleep with me, it would have done the same thing. I'll tell you one thing, the last thing in the world I want to do is sleep with you now. <laughs> do me right here. Okay. See? Ah! Right. Pass me a trick kit. Thanks. Our date is, is totally cancelled. <laughs> I was sitting on the floor for two reasons. One, I tried to lock Elliot in that supply closet and she kicked me, hard. And two, the on-call room was locked. Come on, I got like 10 minutes to sleep. Wait. Whoa. Tell me if I'm going too fast, okay? Lose the clothes. <laughs> I heard that Turk was gonna move in with Todd. I'm surprised that high-fiving freak isn't in there with him. Damn, this is hot. <laughs> nice. Your turn. No, I gotta get back, but very nice. <laughs> oh, hey, Bambi. So, uh, I'll call you, okay? Give me a big uh. uh a big boy uh. Mm. Turk practically. You're not allowed to have sex at hospital. I hope that's very obvious. <laughs> okay. We had sex in the on call room. You realize, of course, I have no idea who Turk is, but. Good for him. See, Billy, <laughs> it turns out that sex is life affirming. What do you say, champ? You got a urine sample in there for me? But I just did five minutes ago. I know you did, but here's the thing. I'd like you to take this cup, put it on the ground, close your eyes, and just go nuts. What do you say? Oh <laughs> boy, go get him, champ. Why are you here? Seems like a good kid. You're worried about being on call tonight, aren't you? Yeah. Look, worst case scenario, you kill somebody, and that hangs over your head the rest of your life. But that is the absolute worst case scenario. 
Come on, Nugget. Look, just have the nurses do all the stuff you're still too chicken to do, which I assume covers just about everything. And if you have a really rough admission... Call you? No. I was going to say go hide in the closet again. Yeehaw! This is fun. Hey, nurse. I'm a doctor, okay? The stethoscope, the beeper, a doctor. Got it? Relax. I just hate it. I hate the darlings. I hate the sweethearts. You don't need to tell me how hard it is being a woman around here. Well, you're certainly furthering the cause by wearing a thong to work and hooking up in the on-call room. Word gets around. You talk like that. Do you even know my name? I spend every second of my life either here or taking care of my mom. So, yeah, maybe I needed a little closeness. I'm sure you never had a quickie at the club, right? Or snuck some skinny, flat-butted college boy up to your sorority room. And my thong? I happen to think it makes my ass look good. And some days, I need to feel good about something around here. And you judge me? Well, guess what? Word does get around Ms. Out for herself, so you can dump on everyone here if you want, but you will not hurt me. Boom. Her name's Carla. We're a team in healthcare. We're gonna work together. But you gotta set your boundaries. Don't take shit. <laughs> actually, you know what? I'm not sure about that. I think um, cohesiveness of the group like, I actually pick my battles. If, if someone's, like, rude or inappropriate to me, I don't just stand up for myself because um, I, you know, I have a certain amount of resilience that I can handle, you know, a certain number of people being... I'm sure after a while I won't have this kind of tolerance, but uh, right now I have the tolerance to handle people being rude and inappropriate to me or whatever. And I think that it's a good thing because it saves a lot of time. Um... The, uh, like it's a bit of a balance though because if you're too nice which I'm probably a bit too nice as an intern then people take advantage of that because people want to just naturally do as little work as possible um, so uh, for example there was this person who needed to get uh, potassium IV replacement and um, and the nurse it was 5 a.m. in the morning <clears throat> and I needed the potassium to go in and the nurse said I checked in an hour later at 6 a.m. to see how it was going and the nurse said, oh, we'll get it at 8 a.m. And I was like, uh, like, no, get it now. And she's like, oh, no, like, we can't get it now. And so she kind of, like, that was a lie. Like, you could get it if it's an emergency. So how do you get it when it's an emergency? Oh, you talk to the after hours, uh, but they're probably busy. It's like, just, just, like, I know I've been nice to you, so you can kind of, like, you know, wait three hours before getting potassium replacement. But no. No, just, just do it. Just call the after hours manager for nursing staff and just get the potassium in now because that's what the patient needs. And it's about the patient, not about you not wanting to call the bloody after hours. Anyway, anyway, anyway. By the way. Oh, yeah. Carla. Thirty-six seconds. That's. Hey, champ, where's night on call? We'll start soon, huh? Gosh, she must be excited. Ah! You betcha. <laughs> oh, about Mrs. Pratt. I heard you wanted to put her on the hospital's transplant list. I just thought I'd recommend keeping her on dialysis a little while longer. Maybe we'll get lucky. No problem, sir. Great. Have a ball on call. <laughs> little poem for you. <laughs> <laughs> that actually is pretty realistic so in we call it um after hours as opposed to on call and then we have people on call for the after hours shifts it's a bit complicated don't worry about it but essentially when you do an after hours shift sometimes the second you start you get paged and i've had two shifts where within the first two minutes of starting the shift there's been a code blue so sometimes, you know, you don't have time to kind of, this is why you want to arrive at work early. So you can set your stuff up and then start, start, start at the right time. You know, if you need to go, you need to go. Please forgive me if I act a little strange. For I know not what I do. Oh. Oh, that's, that is realistic. <laughs> you know, so often patients complain about the food in hospitals. And so often, I, 
I eat a lot, so I'm really hungry a lot of the time. And they're complaining about how crap the food is, and I'm just thinking what I would do to just have that food. <laughs> and I'm too busy. Uh, anyway, it's getting better, guys. It's not always this bad. It's not always that bad, but sometimes you're too busy to eat, and, uh, and you get a bit jealous. Feels like lightning running through my veins Every time I look at you Bambi, come on, let's go. Every That's time realistic. I look at you. So if you're covering the night shift, uh, I've noticed that between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. it's usually quite quiet and you can have a nap. Um, I'm quite against sleeping during night shifts because I try and completely reverse my sleep-wake cycle and I have a whole video on that. Anyway, um, if you do want to nap, guaranteed the second you kind of lie down, your pager will go off or a nurse will come and get you. I'll check on you every 10 minutes, Mrs. Marino, okay? I need to see you in Mr. Bursky's room. Are you flirting with me? You are, aren't you? He crashed. The attending thinks it was a pulmonary embolism. No way anyone could have caught it. Anyhow, you have to pronounce him. Why didn't anybody page me? Could you just pronounce him so I can go home? I'll never forget that moment. The way he looked exactly the same, only completely different. The shame that all I could think about was how hard this was for me. Time of death, 0200. I just wanted to help people. The hardest part is how quickly you have to move on. Don't worry, man, you're gonna be fine. I'm sorry I keep pausing, there's a lot of things coming up. I think um, having an unexpected death is very, very difficult. Uh, and I've I'm very lucky to have never had a patient unexpectedly die. I've had plenty of patients die. I've worked in aged care. I've worked in emergency overseas. I've worked in a bunch of like, yeah, I've, I've had plenty of patients die, but never one that's unexpected that I, that I couldn't, like that people weren't kind of expecting to happen. Um, what he said was moving on is very hard. Yes, because after you call, uh, um, state someone's death, then you have to go on to your next job. That's always really hard. Uh, he didn't do the right thing. Like, I guess there's, there's quite a procedure to announcing someone's death and you have to listen to their chest and feel for a pulse for two whole minutes. And it has to have no sounds. And then you can state, like, then you can kind of officialize their death and you document it and you say the time of death and may they rest in peace. Uh, and it's really hard. Death is never a nice part of life. Um, <clears throat> even when it's like a relief to the family because the person's been suffering, it's still such a monumentous event in that person's life the end of it yeah that's it hey yeah i lied before man i'm scared every second really it's a good thing they make surgical masks because if they didn't everyone would know that my face is like this the whole time <laughs> well i think it's okay to be scared I need you to tell me that every once in a while, man. He needs me? Anyway, I just came to check up on you. See how you're doing. Ask him to move in again. You know, Turk, the offer still stands if you want to... No. I already took the keys out your bag. I love you. <laughs> oh, like that was such a nice I got a scene. second win. You know, it's important to be open and vulnerable with your friends because the way that you deepen a friendship is by uh, being vulnerable. Uh, so many people think that like being the top dog and showing your accomplishments and being Im impervious to pain is what people want. But actually admitting how hard life is and how um, imperfect you are and all your faults is how you deepen a, a relationship. That's my opinion. Uh, and it's shared by uh, like Alain de Bouton, one of the philosophers that I follow. Um, he's like a, he's, I, I guess you could call him a philosopher. Anyway, I, re I really like that point that he makes. It's that showing your vulnerability, showing how you're imperfect, um, how sometimes you're a bit weird. That's how you can connect deeper. A little life lesson in the video there for you. 
Yes, the penny. You. How are you holding up? Ah, there he is, my safety net. I oh, saw that you're still pushing to put Mrs. Pratt on the transplant list. Bad news, though, sport. She doesn't have the insurance to cover it. Yeah, but she's like a second away from total renal failure. Okay. Uh, did you ask the Bursky family for permission to do an autopsy? They're still in there with him, so. It's a teaching hospital, son. You gotta ask. Just tell him you can't see Mr. Bursky again. He'll understand. Sir, do you, do you think I could skip just this one? Why, sure, sport. See? Every story needs a good guy. In fact, why don't you just head on home? You look kind of tired. I am pretty tired. Dr. Torian. Do you not realize that you're nothing but a large pair of scrubs to me? For God's sake, the only reason I carry this chart around is so I can pretend to remember your damn names. Now look, if the patient has insurance, you treat them. If they don't, you show them the door. And if somebody dies, you get the autopsy. You get it by rounds tomorrow morning or I'll be scratching your name off my chart. Are we clear? Answer me. Crystal clear. Great sport. This is a really contentious, big topic with lots of discussion that needs to be had, but I'm just going to make a quick statement. Australia has public health, so you can treat everyone. No, Well, there's always limits, but like, anyway, you never have to deal with this insurance or no insurance business. That is a very common theme in the States and would be a very difficult thing to handle as a doctor. That's all I'll say. I don't get it. If he's the jerk, then who's the good guy? And it crashed in the elevator on the way up. We gotta leave the pressure in his chest. JD, do it. Oh God, no. Look at me. You can do this. And I believed him. Chest soup tray. You know, kinda. Come on, baby, let's go. Chop, chop. Oh, he's doing a do chest soup. You have to do this. JD, cut him or lose him. Hey! Hey! You can't get it through the floor. Well, don't be gentle, get it in there. We don't use. That, that thing is too aggressive. You just use a clips and a, and a finger to say. Normal rhythm. <laughs> hey, it's a piece of cake. So what you just saw was the insertion of a chest drain because of someone having either, probably a hemothorax causing tensioning. Um, what that means is basically he's bleeding into the area around the lung and it's shifting his heart so far that the vessels around the heart are getting kinked and there's not much blood flow going through the heart and therefore you're in a shock state and you're about to die. Now, a couple things were um, pretty inaccurate. First of all, uh, you would normally do an assessment to find out which side the blood is in. So they just started, they didn't like look, for, they didn't listen to listen if they can hear the breath sounds. So obviously if there's a lot of blood around the lungs, you won't hear any breath sounds. Um, you can also see the trachea move away from the side that's filling with blood because of the shift. Um, and so you feel for the trachea and you see it shift. Uh, if you percuss, hopefully that sounds quite, um, that sounds quite resonant, like a drum, but if it's full of, um, if it's full of like blood, it'll sound like a, a muscle. Cause it's, it's, there's no air in it. Um, hopefully that was clear. Anyway, uh, you should probably do an assessment. If you're unsure and they're stable, you can do a chest x-ray. If they're unstable, then you should do either a decompressive ne needle thoracostomy, which is just like a, a needle here, right here. Um, but since it's blood, that's not gonna do anything. So they went straight for a chest ray, which is appropriate. Um, but uh, yeah, that was pretty wild. If that's your first day as an intern, you're putting a chest drain in. Uh, the other thing is they used that big long rod, which is called a trocar. We don't do that anymore. Uh, well, I, some people might. I think I haven't, I haven't seen it been used. We, we just um, use clips to like blunt dissection and then you use your finger to kind of pry your way. Th you use basically metal clips that and your finger to kind of get to the space where the blood is in and then the blood will just come out. The worst part was knowing right then that I could never forgive her. I forgive her. <laughs> you see, I can't survive Power on my own. Kiss. I'm a dork. A dork. A dork. Even now, when I finally get to go home, in the back of my head, I'll know the hospital's still here, wide awake. Bambi. 
get out while you still can. But what the hell? The most important thing is that I got through my first three days without looking like a complete idiot. Oh. I'm the man. I think um, as a final point of reflection, uh, that is a very strange feeling. The feeling that you're in a hospital, you're working, um, but when you leave the hospital, the hospital keeps working without you. Uh, you are a piece of a puzzle in a big uh, jigsaw puzzle, I guess. And um, it's kind of a weird sensation to realize that without you, the hospital keeps going. It's just this kind of organism that lives without you. Uh, and you have to acknowledge your, um, what would you, what would I, how would I word it? Your uh, replaceability, okay? And that's a good thing. It's good that you can be replaced easily uh, because that means there's, consi you know, that means that it, there's no um, dependency on a single person in the system. And that makes for a strong system and a good healthcare system. All right, that's starting to get boring. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I had heaps of fun doing it. It's going to be a long video. I don't care. I hope you, you know, watch it and enjoy it. Scrubs is funny. Um, and uh, yeah, I like doing reaction videos to TV shows. Why don't you guys comment down below the next uh, episode or whatever that you want me to react to. And ha also, by the way, have an absolutely lovely day. Just in case uh, you weren't going to, now you will because I said it. And uh, you can consider subscribing to the channel, consider sharing it to your friends, help the channel grow. Um, and I'll see you all in the next video. All right, bye for now.